Before we can fix a safety problem, we have to see it. Our job is to look for the following. Are the people involved maintaining respect? Do they have mutual purpose? A friend of mine who sails says that because of wind conditions and changing current and the, the tacking of the ship, it's often difficult to know which direction the wind is blowing from. If we're on the mast, there are strips of cloth that are hung. As these strips of cloth blow and are lifted one direction or another, that points the true wind direction. These strips of cloth are called telltale signs. I don't know if anyone out there plays poker, but when you're playing poker, someone gets a hand dealt to them, they look at it, and all of a sudden their eyes widen and a big smile shows up on their face. They're giving you a telltale sign. They're giving you a tell about what's in their hand. They're saying, I got a good hand. And the observant person can often read tales of another poker player. Well, just like sailing or playing poker, in interpersonal communication, there are often telltale signs that tell us when safety is at risk. The telltale sign that mutual purpose is at risk often looks like circling back to the same topic after we've discussed it, or hidden agendas, or startling accusations that seem to come out of nowhere, or a person going into a debate mode rather than a collaboration mode. The telltale signs that respect is at risk are when you see pouting, or sarcasm, or name-calling, or looks of fear, pain, or hurt feelings, or anger, yelling, or insults, threats, interruptions. These are all telltale signs that something is wrong in the dialogue, that safety is being lost. As you watch carefully and learn to recognize these telltale signs, you can begin to identify when mutual purpose is being lost or mutual respect is being lost. What you do to repair ailing safety conditions depends upon which condition is at risk and why. I'd like to share with you three very effective skills used by the very best communicators to restore conditions of mutual purpose and mutual respect when they're at risk or lost. The first skill is called a sincere apology. The second skill is referred to as contrasting. And the third skill I like to call CRIB, C-R-I-B. Now, when you've moved from adding meaning to the pool, to trying to win, to name calling, you owe others an apology. An apology is the first step to rebuilding respect after you really blow it. Now let's be clear about when an apology is in order. You've been downright insulting. Others didn't simply misunderstand you. You called one guy's idea stupid beyond belief, referred to a new employee as a naive greenhorn, and ended with, what else can you expect from a pencil-necked engineer? Your last comment didn't come across as gentle humor. Go figure. When you find that you've gone this far, apologize. Let's listen in on Bruce and Connie as respect is violated. They're a married couple talking over a problem. Listen to the use of this simple skill called apologize. I think it's time for a change. We could lease a new car and cut our payment. What are you nuts? Lease a car? Why? Because it'd be so hard to believe that I would know anything about the financial implications of leasing? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't intend to be so forceful and I certainly didn't intend to imply that I don't value your ideas. I, I just want to make sure that we talk about whether we really need a new car before we decide whether to buy or to lease. No communication skill is as rare as a sincere apology, yet it can go a long way toward restoring the condition of safety called respect. A word of caution. Make your apology sincere. Hollow apologies followed by repeated offenses are an affront in and of themselves. To quote G.K. Chesterton, a stiff apology is a second insult. The injured party does not want to be compensated because he has been wronged. He wants to be healed because he has been hurt. So, do your level best to avoid similar offenses and then return to the topic with the singular goal of getting all the meaning into the pool. Not winning, 
offending, or taking the spotlight. The second skill is contrasting. Sometimes people misinterpret your intentions. You're on your best behavior, and they think you're trying to give them grief. Like it or not, your intentions and others' feelings are only loosely connected. The skill for dealing with misinterpretations around both purpose and respect is as simple as it is effective, and it can be used for both prevention and first aid. It's called contrasting. Contrasting is a do-don't statement that clarifies unintended disrespect or misunderstandings of your motives. That's the don't part. It's also a statement that confirms your respect or true motives. That's the do part. As prevention, when you suspect that something you're about to say could create offense, use contrasting to bolster safety. Here's how it works. A contrasting statement has two parts. First, what you don't want. Second, what you do want. For example, you'd like to talk to your boss about how she dominates conversations. You don't want to suggest that you don't support her. You also don't want her to let conversations drone on needlessly. You just want her to understand there are some important insights she's missing out on. You figure that she's going to think you're meddling, so you use contrasting before the fact. I'd like to chat with you about a concern I have with our team. I'm worried about bringing it up because I don't want it to come across as disrespectful, and the last thing I want to do is tell you how to manage. I do want to share something that I think might make us more effective. Is that okay with you? Contrasting can also be used as first aid. If you're in the middle of a conversation and it becomes clear that the other person is assuming the worst, use contrasting as a cure. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to suggest that you're not good at your job or that I don't like working with you. I bring difficult jobs here because I know you're the best. I just want to talk about completing jobs on time. Contrasting is like revealing both sides of a coin. One side is what you do mean; the other side is what you don't mean. We often state what we want, what we intend, or what we mean. And we leave unsaid what we don't want, don't intend, or don't mean. So others have to read between the lines. When a misunderstanding seems to be taking place around issues of purpose or respect, communicate both sides of the coin. To clarify both sides for yourself, ask yourself these questions. These are the don't questions. What might they think is my motive in this conversation? Or what might they think about my respect for them? The do questions you might want to ask yourself: What is my real motive in this conversation? How do I really feel about them? Let's listen in on a mom and her daughter as they discuss chores. Notice how the daughter uses contrasting to clarify a misunderstanding and restore mutual purpose. Okay, mom. I dusted the dining room furniture and I did the laundry. Can I go?、Um, Let's see what else. Oh yeah, the plants upstairs need to be watered. That shouldn't take too long. And you know what? The windows need a good washing. You do the outsides and I'll do the insides. Mom, quit piling it on. You just add the furniture and the laundry. What? I can't add more work? You know, when I was your age, I had to work all day Saturday, and Sunday was a holy day, so I didn't get to play with my friends. You don't know how easy you've got it. I don't care what it was like in the old days. Look, Mom, I've been working all morning. I asked you yesterday if I can hang out with Sydney and Brandy this afternoon, but you didn't give me an answer. I don't want to avoid helping you. I know you have a lot to do. I just want to find a way to hang out with my friends and do my chores. At a time that's better for me, can't we work something out? All right, that's not asking too much. Water the plants, and I'll let you go with your friends. But I need you to be home by dinner time, and then we'll work out a schedule for the rest of the chores. Okay? Okay. All right. Pretty smart daughter, huh? <laughs> Definitely dialogue smart. Did you hear both sides of the coin, the do want and the don't want, and how she used them to restore mutual purpose? Do you think it helped out? You bet. 
Let's listen as two co-workers, Mark and Jenny, are talking about work. Mark unintentionally communicates disrespect. Notice the power of his contrast. We're going to have to send it to Roscoe. He'll know what to do. Well, why don't I just fix it on my own? It'll be faster. Are you crazy? You can't do that. You're right. What would someone like me know about that? How could a rookie ever know? I'm sorry. I didn't intend to suggest that you don't know what you're doing. I respect your opinion. I know you were trained well. I just want you to know that we're not authorized to do that kind of work. If you want to try, we just have to talk to Kim first. Mark did not intentionally insult Jenny. However, her sarcasm was a telltale sign that respect was being lost. What did he do? Offered a sincere apology and used a very effective contrast to get them back into dialogue. In this next example, Mark's working with a coworker named John, and he's using contrasting in giving instructions in order to prevent a misunderstanding around purpose or respect from occurring. Let's listen in. This time you want to do it differently. Yeah, I know. Gordon told me to step up the quality a notch. That's right. You want to remove the outer bearing. Now, let me be clear about something. That means that your grinder to the bearing is gone, but no more. Last couple of times, you cut into the stock itself. Normally, it doesn't matter. But on this job, it does. Do remove the bearing. Don't cut into the stock. All right, that shouldn't be a problem. I have a jig that'll help me stop exactly where I want. Did you notice Marx used contrasting? He said, do remove the burring, don't cut into the stock. By contrasting up front, then he avoided any possible misunderstandings around purpose or respect. It's a great example of the skill. Now to kind of show you the power of this skill. I'd like to tell you about a plant manager who was newly hired in a large Fortune 500 company. Being new to the company as well as new to the plant, after a week of talking to people and listening, he called an all-hands meeting. First time in the plant's history such a meeting had been called. As many people as could gathered in to the entrance to the factory and then they had arranged video link-up so people all over the plant would be able to see and hear what the new plant manager had to say. He wasn't a man of many words, and uh, he told people he appreciated the warm welcome he'd received, that he had been listening and analyzing, and that he was announcing their three objectives for the coming year. The first was to improve quality, the second, increase production, and the third, reduce expenses. He went on to say, if we achieved these objectives, we would not only have more secure jobs by the end of the year, that he felt confident there would be profit sharing. The next day after making this speech, we arrived to talk over how we might be of help to him. As uh, we interviewed him and learned about the situation, he shared with us that he had just conducted an all-hands meeting and uh, gave us the text of the speech. At lunch, I sat down with some employees and just kind of introduced myself and listened in. As the conversation got going, it heated up, and I realized there were some angry employees. One employee said, oh man, it's gonna be awful around here. I'll tell you, if I had any other job that paid half this much, I'd leave right now instead of enduring the torture that's gonna be coming up. I said, well, what do you mean? What torture? Why is it gonna be so awful around here? He turned to me and said, didn't you hear the plant manager's speech? I said, no, I didn't. He said, we're going to improve quality. The last time we improved quality around here, they hired about 27 quality inspectors that buzzed around like flies, looked over your shoulder, told you what to do, second guessed everything you did. Ah, it was awful. The plant manager said, we're gonna increase production. The last time we increased production around here, it was mandatory overtime. We worked Saturdays and Sundays for 30 consecutive weekends. I almost lost my family over that. And then he said, we're going to reduce expenses. He said, that's just a code word that says layoffs are a coming. I tell you, it's going to be awful around here. I wish I worked anywhere else but here. 
Well, after talking to several employees and finding they felt the same way, I went back to the plant manager. I said, I got a few questions for you. I said, are you going to hire a bunch of quality inspectors? He said, no. I said, are you going to require mandatory overtime? He said, no. I said, do you expect layoffs? And he goes, no. He goes, why are you asking? And then I shared with him what I was learning out on the plant floor. He was flabbergasted. How did they ever get that message out of his speech? Well, we talked about how he had been very clear about what he wanted and what he meant, what he intended, but they had filled in the gaps about what he didn't want, what he didn't mean, and what he didn't intend based on their experience. He said, what do we do? Taught him this simple skill called contrasting. And for only the second time in the plant's history, the very next day, they had an all-hands meeting. As people gathered together and said, what's this all about? What's he got to say now? And listened, he said, it's come to my attention that the three goals I stated yesterday have been misunderstood by some. Let me clarify. When I said improve quality, I don't mean we're going to hire a bunch of inspectors. I do mean that each person is responsible for their own quality. We will build in quality, not inspect in quality. When I said increase production, I don't want to do it by working overtime. That's a budget buster. I do want to improve production by working smarter, not longer working together to improve processes and streamline our methods. When I said reduce expenses, I do want us to figure out ways of reducing scrap and waste. I don't want to reduce expenses through layoffs. In fact, we will likely be hiring more workers this next quarter to meet demand. The employee's response to the plant manager's second speech was applause. One employee was overheard saying, it's about time someone started talking some sense around this place. Contrasting, a very powerful way of clarifying meaning and avoiding misunderstanding, especially around respect and purpose. Of the three skills used for restoring mutual purpose and mutual respect, we've talked about the first one as giving a sincere apology. The second is using contrasting, what you do want, what you don't want, what you do mean, what you don't mean, what you do intend, what you don't intend, in order to clarify misunderstandings. This third skill is used for the most difficult situation of all. What do you do when you're at a genuine standoff? You have different goals. You want to reduce costs, say, and the other person wants to add features. You want to push on until you're finished with the job and the other person wants to go home and spend some time with the family. If the conversation isn't handled well, one person is going to win and the other is going to lose or both will end up losing. These situations never look like the sucker's choices. These situations are genuine dilemmas. Or are they? It turns out that the people who are worst at working through cross purposes ignore the problem. They either push on and try to win or roll over and let others have their way. The good try to compromise. Both win some, both lose some. However, the best, the dialogue smart, try to find a way to come to mutual purpose. They crib their way to mutual purpose. Now, CRIB is an acronym, C-R-I-B, and it stands for C, Commit to Mutual Purpose. R, Recognize the Purpose Behind the Strategy. I, Invent a Mutual Purpose, and B, Brainstorm New Strategies. CRIB is an acronym that stands for four steps to creating mutual purpose. The first, C. Commit to mutual purpose. Second, R. Recognize the purpose behind the strategy. Third, I. Invent a mutual purpose. And the fourth, B. Brainstorm new strategies. Let's examine the four steps for creating mutual purpose. The crib, if you will. 
Let's visit with Scott and Jackie, two co-workers who are at an impasse. Look, there's, there's no way I'd buy stuff like this. It's too costly. But it's well worth it. The vendor has been really easy to work with, and the equipment, Scott, is really quite a bargain. Besides, it meets all our requirements. Well, I'm not going to spend 60% of my budget on one fancy item. Both Scott and Jackie want different things that seem to be conflicting. They're at an impasse. Let's listen as they continue their conversation. Watch as Jackie uses CRIB, C-R-I-B, to create mutual purpose. This is getting us nowhere. Listen, why don't we try and come up with something that satisfies both of us? Otherwise, we're just going to keep arguing and nobody will win. Well, that's easier said than done. I know, but let's at least try to come up with common objectives. Okay, what do we have in common? Uh, well, um, let's start by separating our, our strategy from our goal. Rather than talking about the equipment which we know we don't agree on, let's talk about our objectives. Okay, that's easy. All I want is something that's not going to cost me two-thirds of my budget. I've got to have something to fall back on later on in the year, so I can't commit to more than 40 percent and still have some kind of safety margin. Okay, I can appreciate that. And I'm looking for something that's not going to tie up our maintenance people all the time. Cheaper equipment would just break down too often. It'll be a nightmare. So, if we can find a way to spend less than 40 percent and find equipment that'll work and won't break down, then we'll both be happy, right? Right. Well, Jackie, equipment like that just doesn't exist. You know what? What if we could work out a deal where we put up half the money this year and the rest next year? Scott, the equipment would last for years. I mean, we won't have to buy any more of that for a long time. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, that could work. Let me talk to one of the vendors, see if he could work out some kind of plan for us. All right. How did Jackie do at creating mutual purpose? Pretty good, don't you think? Let's examine the skills she used to get super business results while strengthening their relationship. In the acronym CRIB, C stands for Commit to Mutual Purpose. The first step to breaking an impasse is to unilaterally commit to seek the interest of others. This act has an enormous calming effect on the confrontation, and yet it's so easy to do. You simply point out that you seem to be at cross purposes here. Then you commit to search for a goal that will benefit both of you. Agreeing to agree soothes fears, relaxes defenses, and rebuilds safety. It redefines the conversation as not a debate or an argument or a contest, but rather it's a collaboration. The second step of CRIB, the R, stands for recognize the purpose behind the strategy. What you want and what you're asking for are frequently two different things. One is your purpose, the other is your strategy for reaching it. For example, you're arguing that you should move your offices to a warmer climate and more family-friendly atmosphere. This is what you want. You pick San Antonio as your choice. This is your strategy. The purpose is the what, the strategy is the how. Continuing this example, your partner wants to move to a city with a more favorable tax structure. She selects Denver. Then guess what happens? You argue for San Antonio with such commitment that it's not long until you think San Antonio has magical qualities. Your strategy mutates into your purpose. When we release our grip on our strategy and focus on purpose, we often find that there are many strategies that meet our goals. But there's a better way. Once you recognize that your strategies differ, probe to uncover the underlying purpose. For example, you might ask, why is it that you find Denver so attractive? What is it that you really want from the move? This is a very easy way at getting to their purpose and separating their purpose from their strategy. Then, of course, it's important that you share your own. The third step in CRIB, the I, stands for invent a mutual purpose. As you begin to get at each other's underlying purposes, sometimes the solution is easy. 
you learn that you really have compatible goals, but simply came up with opposing strategies. Oh, so you're interested in Denver because it's family friendly. That's partly why I was interested in San Antonio. I also wanted easier access to our larger clients, but Denver's okay for that too. From there, you jointly explore alternatives that satisfy your mutual purpose. But you're not always so lucky. Sometimes you learn that you actually don't want the same things. For instance, you've come home from work all fired up and want to talk with your spouse, and he or she wants some alone time. In situations such as this, you don't simply discover a mutual purpose. You must actively invent one. You do so by moving to higher and more encompassing goals. For instance, you may disagree on what to do this evening, but you agree that over the next week you want to spend more time together. By agreeing on a larger or longer term goal, compromise in the short term is more acceptable. You feel a sense of mutual purpose and return to dialogue. Remember, there are at least three options for mutual purpose. One is recognize your purposes are already compatible. As we talk about it, we realize we really do want the same thing. Or number two, mutual purpose equals the sum of your individual purposes. You realize that our purposes are not exactly the same, so let's make sure both are achieved, kind of like Jackie and Scott did in the last vignette. Or number three, mutual purpose is invented through a higher value or longer term goal such as, we both want this project to succeed, right? Or, we both want to do what's best for the customer. The fourth step, the B in CRIB, stands for Brainstorm New Strategies. The best tool for inventing or creating a mutual purpose is brainstorming. Once you agree on a mutual purpose, jointly search for strategies that serve the common objective. Safety is now strong, and you're back to dialogue. Now, crib works great when both of you are working for mutual purpose. But what if you want mutual purpose and the other person does not care about your purpose? They only want what they want. In this example, Mark and John are coworkers. Notice how Mark uses crib, C-R-I-B, even though John does not commit to mutual purpose. There's not much to talk about. We both can't take vacation the same week. And since I have seniority, I get my choice. End of argument. But you knew I was counting on a trip, and that's the only week I can take it. I was hoping you could reschedule. The fact is, I'm senior, so I can do what I want, and I want that week. Yeah, but I really need... Obviously, this is getting us nowhere. What if we spend a few minutes and figure out something that satisfies both of us. Why would I want to do that? I already got what I want. What if I could come up with something that you like just as much? Hmm. I don't see how. But what the heck? I got nothing to lose. I know you want the week off, but, but what are you trying to do? Are you looking for a break? Is your family tied in? Exactly what is it you're trying to achieve? I'd like to take a winter break, you know, head south, soak up a few rays. I'm trying to go to my family reunion, that's the only week I can go. Otherwise, I miss the shindig. So, we gotta figure out to do something that gets you down south and me to my family. Wait, and then we'll both be happy. Wait a second, wait a second. I don't wanna head south any old time. I wanna go in two weeks. But what if we could come up with something that, say, three weeks? is more attractive. What'd you have in mind? I don't know. Maybe I could double up or even triple up on the carpool. How's that sound? <laughs> is that a bad idea? How did Mark create mutual purpose? He helped John get what John wanted in a way that allowed Mark to get his purpose as well. Now let me summarize. When you can see that safety is at risk, 
Look to see what's being violated. Respect, purpose, or both. If you've stepped over the line and violated respect, apologize. If others misunderstand your intent or perhaps are about to misinterpret it, use contrasting. Explain what you do and don't intend. Finally, as it becomes clear that you're at cross purposes, crib your way back to dialogue. Let's close with one final example. A group of inspired, hardworking people in a major metropolitan area took on the challenge of trying to create a productive dialogue between two groups of fervent activists. Now, these weren't just two groups of citizens who felt strongly about a cause. These were two groups of activists who actively engaged in city government, in protest, in education efforts. The one group called themselves pro-choice. They believed that abortion is one of several options to deal with an unwanted pregnancy. The other group of activists called themselves pro-life. They said abortion is rarely, if ever, an option for dealing with an unwanted pregnancy. Now, I don't know if you've been following the news, but these two groups have been at odds, ranging the whole gamut from silence to violence, including physical silence and physical violence. They're in conflict over a very difficult issue, and it appears there's absolutely no mutual purpose. The risk here of getting these two groups of activists together is that their conversation would contain no mutual purpose and no mutual respect, and therefore would not enable them to create safe enough conditions to dialogue. Now, in getting these two groups together and challenging them to dialogue, it helped that it was the mayor and his office, which asked them as a favor to spend two days together. No one on either side thought this would be fruitful but all wanted to be seen as cooperative with the mayor's office, and so they agreed. That group of inspired, hardworking people that agreed to facilitate this made some upfront rules. Of the two days that would be spent together, the first day would be spent in training. These activists from both sides would learn some communication skills, some principles of working together, some principles of dialogue. The second day, all of the participants had to agree to use the skills and principles that they had learned in the first day in their dialogue on the second day. And the facilitators could act as referees, interrupt at any time, point out a violation of the rules, and if a person didn't get back in line, then would be invited to leave. All participants agreed to these rules and guidelines. The first day spent together, went pretty well. There wasn't any content discussed or any substance. Rather, it was all training about communication and creating safety. As they convened the second day, the facilitators reminded them of their commitment to use the things learned in the first day as they dialogued in the second day. It took them 20 minutes of dialogue on the second day to agree on a mutual purpose. And once the mutual purpose had been identified, they spent the rest of the second day working on an action plan that would identify how they could work together to achieve their common purpose. Now, I don't know if you're as surprised at what happened the second day as I was. What, you might ask, could they have possibly agreed upon as their mutual purpose that enabled them not only to dialogue productively but create a mutual action plan? The purpose both groups of activists agreed upon was to work together to reduce the number of unwanted teenage pregnancies in their community. To me, this example illustrates the power of dialogue, the power of caring enough about results to make it safe to truly be heard and safe enough for others to express what truly needs to be expressed. The power of working together for amazing results.